What's going on right now in the world can seem overwhelming, frightening even. But most people alive right now have lived through the most peaceful period of human history since the beginning of time. Without context, without history, it can be really hard to process what is going on today. Why some people are on the streets protesting and why some people aren't. I don't pretend to have any special answers, but I do know history. I know its power to inform and shape and contextualize our understanding of what happens in the world around us. It's with this in mind that I present this episode to you, this story, one that has struck me so profoundly, moved me so deeply. And in light of current events, I feel this is a story which has to be told to ensure it never happens again. After his release from Menston Asylum in April of 1961, David returned to a Leeds almost unrecognisable from the one he had left behind. The city was desperately trying to propel itself into the future, and the demolition phase was in full swing. Rows of back-to-backs and old mills were being torn down at a rate of knots. Replacing them were car parks, high-rise flats, shopping centres, and, most beloved of all, the inner ring road. Dubbed Britain's first urban motorway, it is hard to understate just how much people thought this was going to transform things for the better. And, 12 years after he first arrived, Leeds arguably presented an even harsher face to David now. Public mood was turning sharply against immigration. In 1961, the Conservative government introduced the Commonwealth Immigrants Bill, which proposed ending the unlimited right of all British subjects to enter the United Kingdom. It was overwhelmingly supported by the British public. And soon after his release, David managed to secure work at a labouring company in Leeds but the damage from his time at Hyroids was clear. He struggled to hold down the job for very long, it being alleged he was found with his hands in the pocket of another man's coat. And from here, David struggled to ever maintain a job again. By the following year, he even struggled to maintain any accommodation due to not having work, and he became homeless. Old friends who bumped into him barely recognised the man they once knew. The exuberant young Nigerian reduced to a shadow who quietly shuffled along. Around this time, he was often seen sleeping in Lovell Park, which at the time was widely known as Jews Park and other even worse names, due to its use by the Jewish communities who had settled around the area in the late 19th century. It is said that David used a briefcase as his pillow and wrapped himself in the Times newspaper. Each morning when he awoke, he would fold the papers and place them back in his briefcase. It was around this time that David first started coming to the attention of Leeds City Police for being homeless. Sleeping out was not an arrestable offence, but Leeds City Police's standing orders were to direct people to the nearest reception centre. And seeing as this was in Bradford, most people were directed to St George's Crypt, Opened by a vicar during the mass unemployment of the 1930s, the crypt was, and still is, the last safety net before the street in Leeds. When asked by police why he didn't go to the crypt, David would explain that he was treated poorly there because of his colour. Now, what I think is important to pay attention to from here are the often conflicting descriptions of David, and who they came from, And under what context? I feel that large parts of the negative narrative are soaked in racial discrimination. And whilst I'm not trying to absolve David of any of his wrongdoings, they were always framed under this very specific and reductive narrative. That he was somehow less than human. An animal. All the worst and most rank aspects of racism were constantly projected onto his behaviour. Now, there are a few reports from Leeds City Police from around this time of them moving David on from shop doorways where he was sleeping in the city centre. 
Descriptions from officers always said things like jabbering away like a witch doctor, or that they thought David was attempting to perform some kind of voodoo ritual. However, most descriptions from shopkeepers describe a polite but timid man, someone who never gave them any real bother. On the 21st of September 1962, David was on Woodhouse Moor, where, according to reports, he was shouting abuse at passers-by. When the parkkeeper ordered him to leave, David allegedly attacked him and half-severed his finger with a bite. David was jailed for six months. The next few years continued in much the same pattern. Eventually, David ended up before a psychiatrist again, one who knew him from hyroids. The doctor reported that David was utterly paranoid about the police, who he accused of regularly mistreating him. Dr. Power, however, placed David back in Hyroid's asylum on an indefinite hold on the 11th of September, 1965. David lost another 18 months of his life there, not being released until April 1967. And by now, Leeds City Council had fallen under conservative control, and Councillor Frank Marshall was pushing forward in his attempts to rewrite Leeds' notoriously grubby public image. The phrase Leeds, motorway city of the 70s, was plastered everywhere. Even by 1968, more people worked in offices in Leeds than in the clothing industry which had once employed more than a fifth of Leeds' population. The Conservatives sought to pave over many of the city centre's narrow winding streets and create a pedestrianised shopper's paradise. The large number of homeless people, however, were an unwelcome addition to this paradise, a very similar scenario confronting us again today. And so by 1968, every policeman in the city knew who David Oluwale was. Indeed, much of the population of Leeds at that time who frequented the city centre regularly knew David. On the 4th of May, 1969, when David Oluwale's body was discovered by a group of young boys floating in the river air at Nostrop Weir, a nauseating wave of guilt and unease spread across the city. Rumours began to circulate and fester. How had David come to be in the river, just 13 months after Enoch Powell cried rivers of blood? Many people in Leeds thought that they knew the answer. Something was very rotten at Leeds City Police. From February 1969 to October 1970, no less than 12 officers in Leeds City Police Force had been convicted of serious crimes. February 1969, a sergeant acting as a coroner's officer was given a suspended sentence of two years for stealing from bodies awaiting inquest. In October of 69, a constable was fined £25 for theft from a supermarket. In April of 1970, a constable was sent to prison for nine months for burglary. In August of 1970, five officers were convicted on charges arising from theft. The list goes on, all over just 18 months. There are two officers in particular, however, whose cruelty and wickedness stand out above all the rest. Inspector Geoffrey Elliker and Sergeant Kenneth Kitching. In the months following David's death, a young police constable, new to the force, began to report his concerns about the things he was hearing from his colleagues. And what was he hearing? that Inspector Elika and Sergeant Kitching had developed an obsession with David Oluwale. That over the course of 1968 and 69, they hounded him, they abused him, they tortured him. And finally, in April of 69, in the early hours of the morning, they killed him. An investigation was launched, the Metropolitan Police were brought in. Leeds City Police, and the city in general, was under an uncomfortable spotlight. And what was uncovered was a horrific catalogue of systematic racial abuse at the hands of these two officers. Elika and Kitching, both senior officers out of Milgarth Station, instructed every officer upon seeing David to contact them directly. They would proceed to beat David, to humiliate him, 
on countless occasions over nearly two years. They would bundle David into a police van and drive him miles out of the city to Bramhope or Middleton and dump him there in the middle of the night. All with the intention of driving David out of the city, removing what they saw as a problem which nobody else wanted to deal with, the Black Tramp. Everyone knew, many people witnessed, nobody spoke out. But right to the very end, David refused to be bullied. He refused to leave Leeds. He refused to leave where he called home. Until, in the early hours of the morning, on the 18th of April 1969, when, while sleeping outside the John Peters furniture store on Lands Lane, Elika and Kitching beat him violently, chased him down Cool Lane, down an alley which still exists today, right to the water's edge. No one knows for certain what happened next, but 16 days later, David's body was found two miles downstream, showing a very noticeable head injury. The two officers were both acquitted of manslaughter and GBH by the Leeds magistrate presiding over the case. There was no Crown Prosecution Service. Judges were notoriously biased towards the police. Justice Hinchcliffe was no exception. Throughout the trial, he could barely contain his disdain for David and his utter remorse that two of his police officers were in the dock before him. Both officers were found guilty of ABH and convicted. They lived out the rest of their lives as outcasts. The same city which turned a blind eye to David's treatment were quick to cast out those they felt directly responsible. The city was keen to move on, keen to forget, Leeds City Police was soon amalgamated to the new West Yorkshire Police Force, escaping much of the hard questions and soul-searching of a force so embroiled in corruption. The old Milgarth station torn down and replaced, and even its replacement is gone today, replaced by the Victoria Gate John Lewis car park. How in keeping with the story. Indeed, David's whole story might have been forgotten if it wasn't for the work of one man, Kester Apston, who accidentally unearthed the story whilst in the National Archives at Kew. Thanks to his astounding book, The Hounding of David Oluwale, and the amazing work of the charity Remember Oluwale, David's story isn't lost. And I feel, as many others do, that this story is so pivotal in the history of race relations in the UK. It is more relevant than ever in any discussions over policing. This story must be told and told well, so that it never happens again. And Leeds owes an immeasurable debt to outsiders, to its immigrants, to the people it has treated most harshly, yet who have time and time again been who have brought the city its value, its wealth, its purpose for being. We cannot take the Leeds we have today for granted, because it came at a heavy price, one that we don't often talk about. One that was paid by David most of his adult life, and one paid by many others who in the face of constant abuse, constant hostility, work to make this city richer. Work so that we can all enjoy a better life. Now I urge you to visit rememberoluwale.org and check out the amazing work the charity is doing, both to honour David's life and memory, and to work to build a community where this story becomes impossible to repeat. And I urge you to remember David, not the homeless man, not the mental health patient, but the bright and dynamic young man nicknamed Yankee, who always wore a sharp suit, the hope and the spirit, and how that deserved to be respected and nurtured, and how he deserved the same chance as you, the same love as you. Leeds is thankfully a very different place today, a diverse city that I'm proud to call home, But as we are now more acutely aware than ever, we mustn't rest on our laurels. We mustn't ever be silent. This generation, much like David's, will not be judged on the actions of the Elikas or of the Kitchings, but on the silence and complacency of the rest of us.